Thank you very much, Brother Hanley. The Lord bless you, my brother. Good morning, friends. It's happy this morning, privilege, or grand privilege, I should say, to be back here at the tabernacle again and to uh, have this time uh, set aside for our morning worship and fellowship around the Word of the Lord. I believe it was said one time, I was happy when they said unto us, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. To be with Brother Neville again, and my good and precious friends. And uh, I guess it's a little cool, or a little warm back there, and we have, I think, some fans that you can use with your hands this way. If, if um, we got the fans, if you've got the motor, so just to keep it a, a moving. Hey. Or we did have a bunch around here. I think they still have them. I see some using song books or what more. And it's um, one thing we're trying to have service as far is to dodge these places that are are in the future that's hot. So we're that's why we're here this morning, to bypass those places. And only one thing that can do that, that's the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ Amen. does that. And I was uh, very happy to hear the good report of the church that how it is progressing, going on with the Lord, and how God is dealing with you in spiritual gifts. Amen. And I certainly... Are uh, very thankful to God for your sincere hearts that He can deal with, <clears throat> and trusting that He'll keep you right in the middle of that straight, narrow way that you will not move right or left from it. And I want to thank Brother Cove and, and his daughter, I believe it was, that was up here a few moments ago and sang that song. There's no tears in heaven. That's Amen. beautiful, and I certainly appreciate that. And as Brother Neville said about he and I years ago, and I can say that about Brother Calvin. We've known one another for years, and to hear him sing those old gospel songs and bringing his children up in the way of the Lord, it's very uh, elating to my heart. It makes Amen. me rejoice to know that God still has people who love him and care for him. Amen. And we're grateful for that. Now, since I come back, I hear that many has been baptized into the faith, and we're so happy for that. I see my good friend, Brother Elber Gapart, back there. I understand that he was just baptized into the faith, and I'm certainly grateful for that. That makes all of our old hunting crew down in Kentucky just about ready to just take the limit now alone, doesn't it? Amen. <laughs> I remember, and I know Rodney's listening to me in the back room, if he's back there yet, and Charlie's sitting before me when we used to go down there. The boys all like to, well, if squirrels, they'd take a few extra if they could find them. And I got to talking to him, and that wasn't right, so... Now the whole group's just about converting, so I guess yeah, we just have to move over into the next county and get them straightened out over there. Yeah, <laughs> That'll be fine. Yeah. So I sometimes look down as ever minister down the pathway that you have walked and wonder about the, the things that if you have sowed the seed, many of you is well acquainted with Johnny Appleseed and of America, why, there was uh, also uh, a man in Sweden that was considered something like that. He sold flowers, and they say that's why they have so many pretty flowers in Sweden now, and because that they sowed the flower seeds everywhere he could find a piece of ground that seeds are growing. He loved flowers, so he just strolled the seeds around. He's gone on, but his flowers still live. And partings leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Amen. Footprints that perhaps another while sailing over life's solemn main, a forlong and shipwrecked brother in seeing shall take heart again. Yeah. And that's what we all like to see, that something that we have did that will cause others to, to benefit by what we have done. 
A few days ago I was sitting talking to my loyal little friend here in the city, a medical doctor, Sam Adair. And uh, he said, uh, how are you doing, uh, Bill? And I said, oh, pretty fair, I suppose, Doc. I said, yourself? And he said, oh, a lot of patients that have had 15 examinations this afternoon. I said, well, that's good, as long as it's this examinations and finding nothing wrong. I said, you know, the, we got talking about back when we were boys. And I said, well... Doc, I don't know just how long I'm going to be around. We're both in our 50s. And he said, that's true, Bill. And I said, but all these years, about 31 years of ministry now, I have kept my heart prepared for that hour when he comes, so it doesn't matter when he comes. Amen. So he said, that is true. I said, the greatest thrill I have is living for others. And he said, that's what life is, makes life real. It's when you, not what you can do or accomplish for yourself, but what you can do for others. See, Amen. that's when you're really living. And if there happens to be someone among us who has never did that, tried to live for somebody else, give that a try. And you'll see how much more life holds for you. When you will not live for what you can get yourself out of life, but what you can give someone else in life. Amen. And you'll find that it's more blessed than riches or anything of, that can be thought of, is what you can do for someone else. To make life's burdens, which life in itself is a burden, and it will make it a little lighter for someone else, you just... Don't know the joy unless you've tried it once to do something for someone else. And then that uh, brings me to thinking of 31 years will be soon of ministry for the Lord. And I guess every man thinks of some time when he has to come to his last service and come to his uh, last hour and look back down the path and see what has been accomplished. See what's went on. Have you did anything? And if I just said it's what you do for others that counts, I often wonder what would be when I got to the end of my road, which we don't know what time that will be, none of us. So I'm uh, thinking about looking back down along the trail where I've come through life and seeing the different hills and briar patches and rocks and hard places and smooth runnings and what I did in those kind of times. It'll all show up one of these days at the hour of my going away. And it'll do that on each one of us. We will all be sure of that, that it'll, it'll show up to each one when that time comes. And that brings me or leads me to say something that I would rather run than say. It leads me to say something that I, it grinds my heart to the bottom to say it, but what I say I am forced to say. Realizing that this is being taped and the world will hear it. But I have uh, left the ministry for uh, a cause that I'm sorry that I have to leave for. And perhaps many of you have heard it, I closing my office and so forth and leaving the field. Uh... I don't know where our Lord will lead me to, and that I have no control of, or whatever he will have for me to do, but I'm thinking at the end of the road, where I must come. Down along life's journeys, I have made so many mistakes, and I am very sorry from my heart of. Because of 
I guess being human and in weakness and so forth causes a person to do things or say things that, and even act that they would not want to act otherwise. But being the weakness of a human being, while we, we have those times. But uh, there, if there's anything that has been in my heart to do, was to uh, hear those words of our Lord Jesus at the end of this journey, to say it was well done, my good and faithful uh, servant. And many times I have said I'd like to have been standing there when he said, Come unto me. But I did desire to hear it say, Well done. That I did not hear the voice in the original say, Come unto me, back in the times of the writing of the Bible. But I do desire to hear it say, Well done. Yeah. And if anything I always wanted to be, and desires of my heart to be, was a true servant to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I want my testimony to be clean, clear cut, that I stood in all my mistakes, I yet loved him with all my heart, and I do that this morning with all my heart. And because of that, it forces me to say, I'm leaving the ministry. Uh, is because that there is something arose up amongst the people that's caused me to do it. That is that I have been taken from my bracket of a minister or a brother and been called Jesus Christ. And so uh, called, and that would brand me as an antichrist. And I'll meet God as a quitter before I would meet him as an antichrist to take away from him. Uh, I heard of it a, a few years ago, and I thought it was a joke. And I met a couple of brethren, which I don't see neither one of them, in the meeting this morning, two or three of them, one time in a fishing trip, and they approached me by the subject of saying, Brother Branham, aren't you the anointed Messiah, the Christ? And I put my arms around the neck of both brethren, or all of them, and I said, Brethren... As much as I have tried to be a true servant of Christ, I would not that you would say such a thing as that. And if it would ever be said of me, then I will leave the field with a clear conscience, and you who do that will be responsible for every soul that I would have saved during that time, see, for taking me from the field. And uh, I thought that ended it, and I heard it a few more times, but it wasn't so. And the other day in Canada, a brother showed me a little ticket of a thing he's packed in his pocket that said, William Branham is our Lord. Baptizing in the name of William Branham, and a little, a precious, if it had been an enemy, if it had been my enemy, I would have known it was a joke. But a precious, darling brother come up to confess his sins and his wrongs and See, it's faith in me as being Jesus Christ. And I have got letters at home and calls from Chicago and different places asking me if I believe that dogma. And i got all kinds of letters that's come in the last few days and calls from different places. So, uh, uh, saying that I was Christ. Brethren, that is a horrible, disgraceful, ungodly lie of the devil. I am your brother. Now, that would run any person from the field. That would make anyone that loves Christ run from the very thing. I went to the Lord here not long ago when I first heard it about a year ago. And then I went to the Lord, and he referred to me to the scripture that when John came forth of uh, preaching, that they hadn't had a prophet on the earth for so many years until it would, uh, they was all amazed in their hearts thinking maybe John was the Messiah. So then I, John, they went and asked him, and he said that he was not. You read that Luke, the uh, third chapter, 15th verse. And so... 
Then, but that kind of quietened down, so I let it go like that. But then when it comes to this, then I know that something must be done. Now I say this, that the visions and the angel of the Lord that appeared at the river, if this is to be my last message or last thing to the church, to the world, those things are truth as far as the angel of the Lord. And I stood still. The people called me a prophet many times because a prophet in the English Testament is just a preacher, a prophesier, foreteller of the word and so forth. I'd stand for that because you could just kind of push that down. But when it comes to be calling anointed Christ or something, that was too much for me. So I just couldn't stand that. And so then about, I come after leaving the meeting at Canada, I found out that way up in the Eskimos or the Indians up there, it had got among them. And so it just tore me all up in the hunting trip that I had planned so long, I could not take it. I was afraid of a hunting accident, if you understand what I mean. I got so shaky, worse than I am standing here now. And I just couldn't stand it any longer to think that 31 years of ministry went down the devil's gutter pipe into the... When I'm gone, what will they say? There he is. That's exactly what it was. And all the influence that I had upon the people, then you see where it would be? I'd be an antichrist. And I just couldn't stand it. I thought I'd rather die here in the woods like I fell on my gun or something. And, and I seen I was, then I thought about my little Joseph and so forth that had to be raised. And I was no condition to hunt. So I just left the woods and come home. And I've been for about eight or ten days in such a fix I, I thought I was losing my mind. And I just asked everybody to stay away from me and let me alone because I'm in such a fix and nervous and upset and all tore to pieces. And I wondered if it would have been some enemy of mine, it would have been all right, but I would just laugh at it and went on. But when it comes to be precious brothers, precious sisters, then that's what hurt me. And I said, Lord... The great, thing's too great for me. I'll just have to walk out and leave it in your hands. I, I don't know nothing else to do. A few nights ago, to make it sure, I had a, a visitation from the Lord. And I seen a precious one, a baby, a, a serpent, which was yellow and black, and telling me and right along, and, and the thing struck me on the leg. But the blood was so rich it didn't take effect on me. And I looked down... There's where I've been bit before. And I turned quickly with a gun and shot the, the thing, and it hit it right in the middle of the thing. And the brother said, I turned with my gun to shoot its head off. And he said, don't do that. Just pick up the stick laying there by you. And when I turned my back to pick up the stick, it wiggled into some water, just a small puddle of water. And I said, well, it can't hurt very much longer now because I believe the brother realizes, the brethren, that what happened, I said, it'll, it's mortally wounded, so it'll die. And I asked many of my members of my church here uh, in this tabernacle with Brother Neville and I has come approaching me with that same question. Brothers, sisters, haven't I tried to be a true servant of Christ before you? Yeah. Haven't I tried to be your brother? Yeah. I, Wherever it is, it's a spirit on precious people. Many people has asked me that, but it's, it's a spirit. But I hope that the day that it receives a deadly wound and will die out quickly so I can return back to the ministry. Until then, I'll ask you each one, pray for me. I don't know what I'll do. Not place up for sale. I just can't stand it. I, I, I stay around, I'll go completely stark mad. And I'm, I ask you to pray for me. And remember, if you've ever believed me, if you've ever believed me to be a servant of Christ, remember, that is an error. It's falsely, thus saith the Lord. It is wrong. Have nothing to do with it. I am your brother. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, 
My flesh is trembling. My hands are squeezing together. My toes are drawn up in my shoes. Oh, God. Be merciful. What have I ever done, Lord, to deserve this? I pray that you'll be so merciful to me, Lord, and to all. And up there, and them precious darling people, may they see their error on what they have did, Lord, to break the heart of their brother and to not only the brother, but our Savior, our Heavenly Father. I pray that you'll Forgive us of our errors, Lord. Let the holy blood of Christ now draw our beings together, Lord. And blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love and fellowship. God, may the enemy that approached our brothers and our sisters, may it receive the deadly wound that cannot exist any longer. May it just die away, Lord. When you do that, Father, I'll return back to the field again. But until then, Lord, I am your heartbroken servant waiting, waiting. It's beyond anything I could do with tears and with crying and with persuading. I tried, Lord, hard. You know my heart to stop it before it got that far. But it went beyond anything I could do. So, Father, I commit it into your hands from this pulpit to where I've preached for all these years. I commit it into your hand. Now you see to it, Father, in your own divine way. And when it's all finished and everything is over, then thy servant shall return. Until then, I'll be waiting to hear from you, Lord. Bless us now and give us a great service today as we're here, not altogether for this, but just to make it clear publicly before the world that they might know, Father, that I love you and believe you and have stood for you and and want to, if I have to go, let me go, Lord, with a clean heart and a real record that uh, I believed you and trusted uh, you, granted. Uh, and I'll praise thee and we'll give thee glory through all ages yes, that is to come through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. However, in the scriptures, let us turn in the Bible to the I thought this morning it would be a good thing if Brother Neville don't mind All right, just to continue on for a few minutes in. Now, I don't let me hear it one more time mentioned among any of you. Just pray and keep it out. Yeah. Shut it off. See, I don't, I, I'm, I'm 52 years old, but I think maybe if God spares me, I've got a little life left. Now, I want to spend every ounce of my time for Christ. Amen. So, Remember, I'm leaving because I'm driven to do it. Now, in the book of the Revelations, in the fourth chapter where we left off the other day when we were in the study, Revelations, the fourth chapter, I believe at the last part of the verse of the chapter, we left. How many likes Revelation? Wonderful. Now, I believe we quit at the fifth, the fifth chapter, didn't we? We left off the fourth chapter, the four living creatures. Amen. Now, let's approach the word now, forgetting those things are in the past. Father God, you help us now as we are nervous, but we approach the word, forgetting that which is in the past. We press now to the mark of the high calling. Amen. High calling of the ministry to be a servant to Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Give us the word this morning and feed our hungry souls, for we are longing, Lord, and waiting for that precious anointing of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Come among us, Lord, Thank you. forgiving our sins and trespasses and letting us be your servants, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we took the church ages, the last seven church ages, and then um, now I believe some of them are trying to uh, go to write this up, the church ages. Then we come into the fourth chapter of the book of the Revelation. Of, what is this? The revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation. Yeah. Called in the Latin the apocalypse, which means to be revealed, taking the the cover off of, to show, to expose, to bring out the revelation of Jesus Christ, which was, is, and shall come the root and offspring of David. 
Now, in the fourth chapter, we find out that John was caught up into heaven. Actually, he's seen the church ages. Just giving a little background now, and then we'll maybe it'd be best to read a few verses out of the fifth chapter, and then we'll start writing with the background. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne a book written within, and the backside seal with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of, the, of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, and it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven seals. Spirits of God sent forth into all the earth, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. That's the first seven verses. Now, now in the third chapter of Revelations, we find the ending up of the church age, which ended with the Lady Ossian, the lukewarm church age. Then we find out that immediately after that, John was caught up in the Spirit, up into the heavens. Amen. And he saw things that was and was to come, Amen. and things that had been. Now we find out the church doesn't appear anymore until the 19th chapter of Revelations, and she returns with her Lord Amen. gloriously. Washed in the blood. Now, in this last quotation for a little background to get set where John is now, we found out that in the last message, I was just briefly looking over it yesterday, some of the context that I'd spoken of, and John was carried up into heaven and saw those things, and I noticed in there that he'd give me a revelation that, you know, after his resurrection... Many was with him, and some said, What will happen to this man that's leaning up on your bosom, John? Jesus turned and said, What is it to thee if he tarries till I come? Amen. So he never... And then there went a doctrine out. See how easy it can start. There went a doctrine out that, that John wasn't going to die until he seen Jesus coming. Until uh, the second coming, the Bible said there's a doctrine went out of that. How be it Jesus never said it that way? He said, what is it to you if he tarries till I come? Yeah. Now, we find out that he was lifted up into the heavens and saw from then until the coming of the Lord. Yeah. As though he had been there and seen it all happen. John himself did not live. He lived to be 90-something years old and then died. And uh, a natural death, the only one of the apostles after coming from his exile from Isle of Patmos. Now, there's one outstanding point that I would, I think they've taken my, the blackboard down, but I would like to emphasize on a little before we strike this vital thing. Oh, this is glorious. Amen. A wonderful, wonderful chapter. And then the very next chapter begins with opening up these seals. Oh, my. And then we have to skip from there and go different places in the Bible to get these seals when they open and what the mysteries of them are. Oh, they are glorious, just rich with spiritual vitamin. Amen. Now, <clears throat> we see that one of the great outstanding things I'd like to bring your attention to was the living creatures of the last part of the fourth chapter that John saw watching that Ark of the Covenant. You remember how they were fixed just like Israel in its march? They had, uh, now on, there was a face of the living creature, and we found out that these creatures were not angels, 
neither were they man. They were cherubim. And we found them in the Old Testament with the ark. Yes. We find them in the New Testament. And then we find them over in the coming of the Lord. Again, cherubim guarding the mercy seat. The mercy seat which no one could approach unless there was an atonement there for that person. Amen. The only way that the sanctuary, when it was sprinkled of the blood, then it became a mercy seat. But after the blood was taken off, then it became a judgment seat. And oh my, no one could stand the judgments of God. The only thing that we can look for is mercy, not judgment, not righteous righteousness. We cannot approach His justice because His justice, He'll have to keep His word. And keeping His word, the day you eat thereof, that day you die. Who would want justice? I don't want justice. I call for mercy. My, let the mercy of God. And the mercy seat sprinkled. But there was a time of the cleansing of the sanctuary when it was a judgment seat as long as the blood was off of the seat. Now, we are approaching that time now. We are now approaching in this age a cleansing of the sanctuary and a judgment coming upon the earth. See, as long as blood is there, God cannot destroy the earth. As long as blood is there, nobody is a sinner before God. Everybody's right because there's an atonement for everybody. But if you fail to accept that atonement and go into His presence, then you are a sinner. You're beyond that mercy. Then you've judged yourself. But now while there is mercy, but when the cleansing of the sanctuary comes... The blood goes off the mercy seat and then the wrath of God falls upon the earth. Oh, my. God, be merciful to us that we be not in that day found without mercies of God. Now we see in there, I'll try to uh, kind of spiritualize it here or draw it for you by my hands, that there were four corners how Israel uh, camped themselves. They put the the ark in the center and on the four sides of the tent was three tribes of Israel and three forces, twelve or four threes, rather twelve. And each tree had a head. And each head of the tribe, one of them was Reuben. He always camped to the, the south. He was the head of man. And Ephraim was to the west with three tribes. He was uh, the ox. The... Then on the east was Judah, which is the lion. And on the north was Dan, which was the eagle. Now, notice, you remember them? All of you remember them well, how we had them drawn out? The eagle and the ox and the, the man and the lion. Now, you notice Judah guards the eastern gate. And Christ is the line of the tribe of Judah. He shall descend from the eastern sky, enter in by the way of the gate. He comes from the eastern gate from the tribe of Judah. And he's the line of the tribe of Judah. And we find out over in our coming message this morning that he still is proclaimed the line of the tribe of Judah. The root, the very beginning of David. David was the king eternally. And Christ sits on the throne of David in the millennium, which is eternal king. There will never be one fail. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Never be one fail, David. God promised that. Said none would ever fail, David. Not one. And you say, what about today? Where's those Jewish judges? He still has the seed. Christ is his son, Amen. according to the flesh. There one sets there, David shall not fail. That's right. And Christ is that line of the tribe of Judah, from which David sprang from. Now, we find out that they were the guards to the mercy seat. They watched the mercy seat. Nothing come to it. 
It crossed over the tribes first before it could get to the mercy seat. Every man willing to give his life. Every Israelite camp would die before anything could enter into that camp over there and take that mercy seat. And now we find out that was the Old Testament order. And in the New Testament order, we find the same thing, that it was guarded, the mercy seat. Oh, I hope you get it. The mercy seat is still guarded. Still got the guards. We found out that those guards were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John guarding the book of Acts. The Acts of the Holy Spirit done amongst the apostles, which is the, the book of Acts of the, uh, New, of the New Testament, and the four writers of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all guard that mercy seat to show that it is God, Amen. the Holy Spirit. Today, each scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everyone will back up the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. in the act of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we get beyond that, then that's not it. But it backs up the true message. Like we find out in uh, Acts 2.38, for repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And today they adopted the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost to be baptized in. There's no scripture for that. There's no background. There's no, there's no nothing to guard that. Not a thing. You say Matthew said it. Matthew guarded it. Matthew 28, 1, 18 says, The birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was bound with a child of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This was all done while Joseph, her husband, rather being a just man, not willingly to make her public example, was minded to put her away privately on this while. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee, Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And the Holy Ghost and God the Father is the same person or he had two fathers. Amen. Amen. So you see, and she shall bring forth a child, call his name Jesus, and this is done that might be fulfilled, spoken of prophet. God would be with us, called Emmanuel, which is God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in one name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Guard that Amen. gate against error. A few days ago in Chicago, before a ministerial association of Chicago, Greater Chicago, I knew the Holy Spirit got me up in the night and told me to stand by the window. said, there is a group of ministers and they're fixing a breakfast for you. said, be careful, they're going to attack you upon this. I said, thank you, Lord. He showed me where it would be set and I went and told some ministers, Brother Carlson and Brother Tommy Hicks, how it would be. I said, the place that you've ordered, it won't be like that. We're going to be in another place. Told how a doctor and me to be set and how a colored man would come in set this way and all about it. Then that morning they said, my son said to me, he said, Daddy, you going over there and that fuss? I said, I ain't going over a fuss. I'm going over anointed with the Holy Spirit with the Word of God that will guard that mercy seat as long as he's there. So when we got down there before they even had a chance to ask one thing, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, now's the time to say it. I said, I know why you're here. And I said, now, Brother Hicks and you, Brother Carlson, the head of the Christian businessman, I said, isn't everything just exactly where the Holy Spirit told me day before yesterday that you did not get that room we'd be over here? And just got it that morning. And I said, now, I look at everybody's place just the way it said it would be. I said, the thing you want to approach me on is on the name of Jesus Christ for baptism. And when we, the Holy Spirit began to take the Word of God and reveal it and interpret it down like that, when all those bunch of Trinitarian ministers sitting there reaching under the table and shaking hands with one another, tears running down their cheeks, and I understand that 72 of them is coming down here to this tabernacle for me to baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The mercy seat is guarded. See, the Holy Spirit guarding the mercy seat. We must keep it just exactly. Let that word of God then great messengers sitting there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that backs up every act of that New Testament. Praise and now, now, that's exactly what I said in the first part of this morning's message. Let's keep it right there, guarded by the gospel. Amen. Keep it right there where the gospels will guard it. Now, 
We find out in there they were guarding God's mercy seat in the Old Testament. And there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all of them, and even the lion of the tribe of Judah laid down his life uh, to guard that mercy seat amen. that it be sprinkled with his own blood. And there he stands this morning today, the great conqueror, who oh, shall descend from the east someday, and we shall see him now. We turn quickly, because I know there's a baptismal service. What is this seven-sealed book? Oh, what a great thing. Did you notice how it says here? It was seven seals on the back of the book. It's something, oh, may God help us now and give us courage and maybe sooner or later I can get it to you. Look, this is not written in the Word. It's sealed on the back of the Word. The book was sealed by these seven seals. The whole mystery of the book is sealed up in these seven seals. This is one of the most greatest chapters in the whole book of the Revelation. Look, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne a book written within and written within, inside's written, that's what we're reading this morning, and the backside sealed with seven seals. Outside the Bible. What the Bible doesn't even say. It's sealed in here with seven seals. Amen. The mysteries of God. Now, what is it? Now notice, a seal represents a finished product. Something that has been already tested, proven, and then sealed. Where is we have the earnest of our salvation now by being sealed with the Holy Spirit. That is the earnest of our salvation. Let's go back just a minute. I, I've got a scripture written down here, several of them. I don't want to have time to get to all, but let's go back to Ephesians just a moment and read the, in the first chapter of Ephesians so that you might get the real meaning Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus. And remember, John had this letter addressed to the Ephesians, to Ephesus, and the faithful in Christ, the ones that Paul had preached to and brought up, nurtured with the gospel. The Ephesus. And to the faithful in Christ. That's those who are already in Christ. How do we get in Christ? By one Spirit. We're all baptized into one body, which is the body of Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Think of it now. He has blessed us with all heavenly grace, blessings, as we assemble together in Christ Jesus. As the believers, the elected church, called out, set aside, He sealed us in by His Holy Spirit and now is revealing to us all the things that is in the future for us. Now we're up to the seven seals, according as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame and love, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to His own good pleasure. What a beautiful thought this is. Let's just read on just a minute. I want to get down here especially to the 12th verse and 13th, 14th that we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Him, in whom ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth and the gospel of your salvation, whom after ye believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, after ye believed... Oh, my Baptist brother, how could you say that isn't so? You say you receive the Holy Ghost when you believe? 
It's that after you believe, then you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Notice. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Now, we find out then that a seal means that it is a finished thing with God. It's already settled. And every believer was sealed with this promise from the very beginning because before the foundation of the world we were predestined unto the adoption of sons before the world ever began. Oh, what a hope that makes us rest steadfast and sure. I anchor to the soul that not tossed about here and there, but anchored in Christ, a hope that sure predestinated us before the foundation of the world to the adoptions of sons by Jesus Christ. Oh, how wonderful. I love that. Finished work with God. Now let me just quote another scripture to you. All that he foreknew he has called. All that he called he justified. All that he has justified he hath glorified. Amen. All the way from the beginning God in his great infinite mind foresaw his church and predestinated it unto the adoption Amen. of children to Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ at the end of the day. Hallelujah. What a beautiful thing. Praise Brother Neville, that just makes me feel lots better. Hallelujah. Uh, adoption Hallelujah. by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, notice as we go on. Uh, now we know it's a finish. We are predestinated with the Lamb. The Holy Spirit is our seal. The earnest means more is yet to come. We only have the earnest of it now. The earnest is just the down payment. Oh, how beautiful. Just the down payment that holds it and secures it and anchors it so no one else can touch it. Amen. It's the earnest of our adoption. Hallelujah. Amen. God. The Holy Spirit is now the earnest of God in our hearts. Seal the adoption of sons awaiting us at the end of the road. Uh, sons and daughters of God. Let's turn to another scripture right quick. I got written down on this other page here. Romans 8, 22. I think it's beautiful. Now, in studying yesterday, I kind of wrote out a few scriptures here that I'd like to refer to. We know that we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pains together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies. Amen. Oh, do you see it? All creation is groaning, said Paul. Everything is groaning. Look at the trees, how they struggle. Look at the flowers, how they struggle for life, just for the frost to tear them down. Look at the trees, how they struggle to hold their branches out and sing glories unto God. See, everything, all nature, all animals, all birds, how he flies from the enemy quickly and gets away. Everything groaning. And we ourselves, said Paul, we groan too with them. Amen. For we are waiting for the redemption of our body. But now, Amen. now they did all those years until now. Now we have the earnest of our inheritance. Oh, what do we have? We have the evidence. That God lives. We have the evidence that God is with us. We have the evidence that God has not forsaken us. That we are His and He is ours because we, in our bodies, we now tabernacle. 
the Holy Spirit of God that cries out, Abba, Father. Amen. And there's nothing can ever take that away. Hallelujah. We are anchored in Christ. Now the trees does not have it. Nature does not have it. But yet we are still groaning with them because as yet we haven't received the fullness of our adoption, but we have the earnest of it. Amen. That we were picked up from the things of the world. And now become sons and daughters of God. Hallelujah. What kind of people should we be? Oh, oh my, when we think of that. Think of it. Now we have the earnest, our spirits groaning for the full adoption. But now we have the earnest of it as we receive the Holy Spirit. It is the earnest of our complete adoption, our complete salvation. Amen. Oh, how beautiful. Hallelujah. I just love that. All right. We are waiting for the fullness of adoption. This will take place when? At the first resurrection. Hallelujah. That's when our bodies will be changed from these vile creatures that we are, and we'll have a body like His own glorious body. For we shall see Him as He is, and we will be like Him. When He appears, we appear in His likeness. We will have a body like His, a glorious, glorified body. And all the trials and struggles of life will fade off into a little myth and blow away to never be no more. And these earthly tabernacles which we now have grown in, we are waiting for that earnest, that earnest uh, for the salvation fully in its fullness to come. But now in these tabernacles of clay, we have something that tells us Amen. that we have raised up so far. Hallelujah. Amen. What is there in this? It's the little down payment Hallelujah. that holds it, Brother Dow. It's the earnest. Now, once when we love the things of the world, once when we sinned and went about doing things of the world and cared not for God, we were alienated from Him without God, without Christ in the world. Now, God sent His Holy Spirit, and through that, we are lifted up from those things. Amen. Now, we have the earnest that we know that we pass from death unto life. Amen. Praise Amen. Here, as I was trying to show this, like this, here's where the ordinary sinner runs, down here on the bottom. Now, the Christian goes up a little higher than this. He rides above all that stuff. That's the earnest of his salvation. Now that you might know when what visions do to you. So help me, God being my judge, I never intend to have another one. If it does, I'll keep it to myself, see? Because I see what it does. The people are not ready for such a ministry, so you just have to let it go, you see. Go on back here, but if I ever come to feel again, I'll be an evangelist. But look here, on this year, coming back in here, up in here, you go up into this heaven, these up in here. You live right up around in those rims there. You go beyond anything that man can think of. Beyond anything of them things. And it brings you up into them spaces there. But you see, now we have by the Holy Spirit the earnest of our inheritance. Because we've been lifted up from the things of the world and we ride right along with the world, but we are above the world. Amen. Oh, brother Neville, Hallelujah. God be merciful and grant to the church of the living God when we ever get to a place to think that the church, the beautiful church, that we're trying to compare with the things of the world. We're trying to have a better basketball team than they got. We got to have a, a better building. We got to have a better bunco game. We got to have better this and better that. Why, how can we ever compare it with the glamour and the glisten of the world? Amen. We are not. The gospel is a glisten. It's a glow. Amen. Amen. There's a difference between a glitter and a glow. Amen. Amen. See, we just go around, as I've said, taking one uh, one corpse from one morgue to another, changing members and things like that. Well, what good does it do us? And we're trying to make it glittery. Big, fine steeples. Great, big, fine places. we got to have a better than the Methodist or a better than the Baptist. And we're all trying to compete with the Catholic. And we're having bunco games and parties and suppers and entertainments and everything. The church can never compare with the world. Amen. How can you do your church entertainment ever compare with the Masonic Lodge or, or any of those people who can entertain? Amen. That's their grounds. Don't try to go over on their grounds. But we got something to have it about. We got Jesus. Let that come over here if you want to. Stay in Christ. We have Jesus. They don't take can't have Jesus. Watch how they come over here. 
And when we get over there, we're off of his ground. Don't try to glitter, glow, and you can't glow. You've got to let it glow through you. The little glow worm, he doesn't glow because he wants to glow, because he does glow. There's something in him glowing. It's in himself. It's himself doing it. Something inside of him is glowing him through. Well, that's the way it is with the Holy Spirit. We don't have to be peculiar, be different, be anything more. Just let loose and live a godly life and just let Amen. God live through you. That'll go for the gospel. Help us, Lord. See? Help Not us. glitter. Glitter, that makes monkeys jump at things like that. Anything Amen. glitters, you know, they always jump for something shiny. But glow is a soft, mellow sweetness of the, of the Holy Spirit. Now, we are waiting for that resurrection. But now, do you understand? Say amen if you do what I mean amen. by saying the earnest. We've been, we, we know we have passed from death unto life because we're lifted up. We are lifted up, not in ourselves, but lifted up from the things of the world that we love everybody. And God loves us and we know it. And we watch our lives and see that it is the Holy Spirit because we don't no more care for the things of the world. Amen. There you are. As long as you love the world, the things of the world, and the love of God's not in you, you see. But as long as you're above that, then you know you have your inheritance. Hallelujah. You're on your road to your full redemption. And now, that will not come, you see, until we have first, first, we must see Jesus. And when He comes, then we'll have a body like His body, and we'll be made like Him. All right. Now we see something that was lost here because the Bible said so in, in the book here that it has redeemed us. What are we redeemed from? Something we must have lost. Before you can be redeemed, there must be something that redeemed us back and all the inheritance that we had has been, has been redeemed back. Then we must have had something one time that we do not have now that this lamb come to redeem. Amen. See? We had something we was lost from. Now, notice. What did we lose? Well, it was given to Adam to have eternal life. As long as he eat from the tree, he had eternal life. And we uh, notice again that Adam was the... Uh, he, he inherited the earth. He was a, like a, an amateur god over the earth. The earth was his. Everything was given into his hand. He could do with it whatever he wanted to. He named it and called it and done whatever he wanted to. He was truly a son of God. Now, in the fall, Adam forfeited the title deed to that. Amen. He forfeited it to Satan. Amen. Satan took the title deed. Adam was very slowful, and he did not redeem his rights, for he could not redeem his rights. But Satan, which does not rightfully own it, but he possesses that. He is the God of this earth. Amen. 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 He possesses that. Not because that he that he, he really rightfully gets it, but he possesses it. Now do you get it? Amen. Satan possesses that. He holds it into his hand. Death is in his hand. The earth is in his hand. The world belongs to him. Every nation belongs to him. He governs and controls the whole world and everything in the world. Amen. Satan does. But thank God we're not all the world. Amen. Amen. There you are, see? Uh, we're, uh, I don't mean the church. He don't control the church. He just controls the world. Amen. He said they were his, and he's the God of the world. Jesus said he was, and he is. Amen. He's the God of this earth. has blind the eyes of the people. The God of this earth. He's the God of heaven. And now he rightly don't own this. He does not own it. But he's forfeited the... And Adam forfeited the title deed to it, to this all this stuff that we own, eternal life, and the uh, inheriting of the earth... Jesus said in Matthew 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit Amen. the earth. Amen. See? Now, we don't have it now. And look, it wasn't that Adam or any of his seeds, Adam's seed absolutely lost everything too. It's not the seed of Adam. No matter how much we try to beautify it as the world, and how much we try to make big fine homes and things, it still doesn't belong to Adam's seed. Amen. Amen. No, sir. Amen. It did not go to Adam's seed. No, sir, because Satan took it lock, stock, and barrel. Amen. Right. Amen. For Adam forfeited it. Now, Hallelujah. oh my. Amen. Yes, so many things could be said. I just don't want to take too much of time now, so we have to baptize. Uh, All right. 
He possesses it, but he does not rightfully own it. Satan does. When the rightful owner, rightful owner, owner lost it, there's only one way that it can be redeemed. Amen. Now, that's by a near kinsman. Is the only one who can rightfully redeem it. Now, of course, this we have in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to say something here. The first thing that we want to go back to is if we go back in the, in the Old Testament. You know, I believe I got it wrote down here somewhere in Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25, 23, 24, you can get the laws of redemption, you who are putting down. To redeem anything, when a man, when God gave Israel, it's dividing this land up through Joshua. Each tribe and each fellow was given a land. Well, his children inherited what his possession. Now, if this man got poor and lost anything to another man, this uh, only way it could be redeemed would be by a near kinsman. But it finally must come back. This man only holds it for a certain amount of time. It must come back to the original owner. Amen. Right. It must go back to the original owner. The, if it is out of the tribe of Judah, if it was... If he was there and this was lighter to his father, then it was to him or some near kinsman could take it. But now nobody else could write. They, they could hold it. They could hold the deed on it. They could hold the deed until the debt was paid. But when the right man come along, the person that, say for instance, if I owned a piece of property and I lost it and I sold it over to Brother Neville, which is of a, another tribe of Judah, or maybe sold it to an alien, and uh, he rightfully owned it. He owned it. He could come in there and farm it and take the goods off of it and so forth. But really, he just held the deed. He could not own it. That was a law in Israel. Amen. Now, you really read, read Leviticus 25, and you'll see that they could not rightfully own it. He just held it. Well, now, for instance, my son, wanted Billy back there, wanted to take my come by this ground. Well, then, if uh, the alien or Brother Neville or, or some other person owned it, was holding a deed to it. Now, if this was my next kinsman, was my blood relation, he could not hold it any longer. Amen. Amen. No, sir. He had to give it over. Yes, sir. When that price was paid, Amen. when he gave him, say, $25,000 for the piece of property, well, then, say, uh, Brother Tony would come over and say, uh, Brother Neville, I'll buy Brother Brand's property. He couldn't do it. Brother Neville would say, No, sir, I don't want to sell it. What did you give for $25,000? Well, I'll, I'll give you $35,000. I'll give you so and so. I don't care what you want. I don't want to sell it. I'll keep it. But Billy Paul could come along and say, I want my daddy's possession. Here's your $25,000. He had to let it go. That's right, because that was the law. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Hmm. I hope you Christians see it. We are the salt of the earth. God gave this to His sons. He gave us the jurisdiction over all nature, all animals, all life, everywhere. But Adam, our father, forfeited to Satan. But where does it fall back to the right corner? God who made it. No wonder John said he wept bitterly. For he could find no man who was worthy to redeem it. The man must be worthy. John said, I wept bitterly. When no one was able to take the book or to look on it or loose the seals out, he said, well, no man in heaven, no man in earth, no man beneath the earth, no man everywhere. No man. Now, he never disregarded angels. Remember, this earth wasn't given to angels. It's the inheritance of man. Amen. Amen. Gabriel was worthy, sure. Somebody else was worthy. Michael might have been, not as, he might have been worthy to do it. But there was no man worthy. Amen. See? Amen. And John wept loud. Amen. Someone said, because he found himself not worthy, that is his soul. The man is under the influence of the Holy Ghost. He couldn't make an error like that. Amen. But he, he was, he, he was, he was, he wasn't, he was not only worthy, he could find nobody worthy. So just then he says, an elder came forth there, a strong angel, said, we not. Amen. For the line of the tribe of Judah. Amen. Amen. The root of David. Hallelujah. He has prevailed. Amen. Amen. Comfort, in other words. Amen. He is worthy to take the book. Amen. Amen. Remember, we hadn't seen him up to this time. 
Why? He was seated on, seated on a throne in there, God's throne. He was on the inside of the sanctuary. He hadn't seen him this time. So John was expecting to see a, a lion come forth, but he saw a lamb. Yeah, yeah, there you are, better to me as through sweetness to the Holy Spirit that we conquer. Not some great, mighty, intellectual giant. Yeah. But he that can humble himself is a man who conquers. Yeah, a man who can be kicked around and still be a servant of Christ. Yeah. That's a comfort. Yeah, now he said he has prevailed. And he's worthy to take the book and open it and to loose the seals thereof. Now we're going to find out after a while, maybe not today, but what these seven seals hold, what they did. Now let's take a little bit on redemption. Before, before this person could be, uh, could redeem, the first thing, he had to be worthy. He had to be the right kind of person. So this was accomplished when Jesus Christ was born a virgin birth. For he was God. He was God himself made a man. He was God in human flesh. He had to be worthy. And the virgin blood of Jesus Christ made him worthy. Now we find out, if you want to go to the scripture of it, 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20, if you're keeping the scriptures down. He had to be worthy, and he was, because he took upon him the form of man. And he became man. God became kinfolks to us. And there we find then the beautiful part of God Jehovah made flesh and dwelt among us as a worthy one. Oh, and amen. He prevailed. God took on the form of human flesh and came to the earth as born a little baby and walked among us. And through his holy blood, he prevailed. Now, in the Old Testament, how a man was to proclaim his own, what did he do? He took an uh, elder, ten elders, and went to the gate and introduced what he was doing to redeem what he had been lost and sold who he was and has given witness. We find a beautiful story here. As I had a little note wrote here, just so I wouldn't forget it, being nervous this morning, up on Ruth, the kinsman, and Boaz. We went through it not long ago. I want you to notice the three stages now of this resting. I want you to notice the resting of the church, just exactly the same thing. Now watch, the first place we find, as we've all been through that sermon, the kinsman redeemer. God was made flesh in order to become the redeemer. He was the one here in the fifth chapter, in the fifth chapter said, And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open the book or to read or to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. He's the one. He's that one we're looking at. Notice how Ruth how in uh, Neoma, Boaz is just a perfect picture. How Neoma, in a time of famine, left the church, left the country, went over into the Moabite land to dwell there and sojourn in there. She lost all she had. And when she went away, her husband Amalek died while he was over there, so that left his inheritance to fall to anyone. Then when, we come, when she comes back, she brings back the beautiful young Moabite widow, with her, and when Boaz saw this widow, a type of Christ, he fell for her, and he loved her. So he had to redeem. The only way he could ever get her to be wife was to redeem what his brother Amalek had lost. And so then he asked his other brother if he would redeem it. One closer, and he he couldn't do it. So he went down to make a perfect uh, example of the laws of God. He went to the gates and he kicked off his shoe and said, Let it be known this day that I have redeemed all that Neoma had, all that she has, all that Am- Amlick, my brother, lost. I am the next kinsman now, and I'm the one that can redeem it, so I have come to claim it. If there's any man here can show a just cause, why are anybody close to me? Let it be known. And everybody kept their mouth shut. So he kicked off his shoe and told it for a testimony. I have redeemed all that our brother Amlick had. Why? He was a kinsman. He was a kinsfolk's redeemer. Oh, how beautiful it is. It's such a beautiful story. And then all this time, Ruth was resting and waiting to find out how it would come out. Then he comes back. No one can give a testimony against it. 
He come back and took uh, Neoma and took Ruth, the beautiful Moabite girl, and they were married and lived on this possession. What a beautiful story! There's three stages of Ruth. Ruth, uh, 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 Ruth deciding. She was deciding whether she would make the decision or not to go back into the homeland, just like the church. Ruth serving when she went out to glean. Ruth resting. That's what Ruth is doing now, the church. Now, Ruth rewarded. Now, that's what the next thing happens is the reward of the church. Now, we can't, don't have time because she got a baptismal service and it's quarter after 11 now. But maybe we'll pick this up next Sunday or some other Sunday in the future, the Lord willing. Uh, and I'd like to take this down here to show these seven horns and seven eyes. And exactly those seven seals, seven ministries, seven angels in the church, seven stars, seven... Oh, it's so beautiful. And right here ties the whole thing together. Yes, sir. It had to be worthy. So Jesus is worthy. <clears throat> At His return, we will fully enjoy all the fullness of redemption blessings. Meat shall inherit the earth. Men and women shall be back sons and daughters of God. And the complete millennium swing will be Amen. What a beautiful thing. And the strong angel with a loud voice proclaiming, Who is worthy? Who is able to do this? And then the elder said, Don't we? For the line of the tribe of Judah, he is worthy and he has overcome. And he tucked the book and open the book and loose the seals thereof. And never told what happened to them when we hit them seven seals being opened right down through the Bible. Watch what took place. Amen. Right in this seven seal book that we're in and out holds the whole mystery of all the redemption blessings of God. Remember, He is the Lamb. He's the only one that redeemed it. And remember, it's sealed on the back side of the book, not written within. Amen. It's sealed on the back side. And it's not written within. And he was the only one was able to even open the book or to reveal the book or to reveal the seal. Amen. The only one that could do it. So this is one thing. They might squabble about this in here, about what it is, but he's the one that divinely interprets it. But on the back side here, there's no one can do it. It belongs to him and him alone. And he's the one that can reveal those seven mysteries. Out. And watch it. Every bit of it is on redemption how the church was redeemed and what will be the redeeming. Oh, let us just love Him with all of our hearts. Do all that we can. A certain writer was writing a story just before I closed and turned the service back to Brother Neville. Do you enjoy a revelation? Oh, I just love it. Amen. We just got about three verses of it this morning, but we'll pick it up again. Notice, we just, a writer was writing a book about a young girl that was trying to find God. There's so many times that we uh, hunt for God and look for God and if God was just everywhere and you had a great big, well, if you had a great big throne sitting up here somewhere, everybody would believe in God then. If God sat up on a big throne here somewhere, say, He sits in this certain city and here He is, this is God, you go to Him, you turn it like that, well, everybody would believe Him. Then, Faith would be void. We wouldn't have to have any faith at all. Anything. That would be it. That will be in the millennium. But now he's calling and trying to find out those who it looks mysterious and dark. And you don't know how to do it. But by faith we believe it. We believe it. That's the reason it's this. You understand that, Brother Elmer? See, that now if God set up on a throne and said, Well, here, there, here's God. He lives down in a certain place. We'll go down there and say, uh, uh, Dear sir, God, uh, uh, would you do it? Yes, I'll do it. And it'd be done. See? Well, of course, that's God. See? Well, we see that. So, it would be no, faith would be made by. Faith's no good when you're positive. What if every person in this world was a Christian? What if everybody was a, a spirit-filled Christian? Well, we wouldn't need any faith no more. Amen. Wouldn't need any faith at all. Amen. And faith is the, very, is the very thing that we're saved by, I think. Amen. And that's the reason there has to be some disagree with it so that we can exercise faith. Amen. Uh, Do you understand it now? Yeah, well, you've got to have the other side. See? You've got to have a bad woman to make a real one stand out right. See? You've got to be a lie to make the truth positive, make it shine good. If everything was truth, it would just be so common. See? Yeah, see? But you see, it's something royal. It's something real. When truth and faith and so forth. Now, there we are. Now, we've got to have these pro and cons. That's the way it goes. You've got to have good days to make you enjoy it, or bad days to make you enjoy the good. 
You have to have a little sickness to make you enjoy good health. See? And you have to have your valleys to make you enjoy the mountaintops. And so then some of these days they'll all be mountaintops. They'll all be health. They'll all be God. They'll all be joy. They'll be unending joys. But until that time, see, we got to have this pro and con. Now everybody understands that? Say amen. Amen. This girl was telling that she was trying to find God. Everywhere she went, she'd go to this church and that church and whatever more, but she couldn't find it. Once she found it going down the road, there was a little old man going down the road, a little fella, and he had a whole big cathedral on his back. He was walking down the road, and she said, oh, good man. She said, my, that's awful nice of you. He said, but uh, uh, you, you, you got the whole thing on your back. He said, uh, uh, it'll crush you. He said, no, it won't crush me. Except for I am the rock that it's built on. Amen. That's him. Let's pray. Oh, rock of ages. I'm so glad that he's right in the cathedral, knowing that we're resting up on the rock. Oh, he said the rock. It's no more than paper. And as the rock began to move along swiftly with it, the beautiful bells begin to chime on the inside. O rock of ages, hide us in thy mercy. Carry us down the road and stream of life that our hearts will be full of joy and jingling praises to thee all along the road. We thank thee for this visitation this morning of the Holy Spirit in the Word as it comes in and makes the Word so real to us. Forgive us of our shortcomings and all that we have did or said that was wrong. Forgive us for it. Help us to be better Christians, Father God. We pray that your mercies will rest upon us. I ask, Lord, to be your will that we can return again pretty soon and, and finish these chapters here and take these seven seals. We're, we're looking forward to that time, Lord, when you, you, you let us do that. And Father, right here in your own little church, we pray that you'll grant it to us and we might uh, understand these great things of God, not because that we deserve it, Lord, but our hungry hearts are bleeding for it. We pray that you'll grant it. We pray for our brother Neville, Lord, our faithful God-sent pastor. We pray for him that you'll help him and bless him. He and his sweet little wife, beautiful little thing, and his little children. We pray for all the trustees and the deacons and everybody comes to this church. Not only for ours, but for others and all that calls upon your name. I pray for my friends from across the country, just a breast notice, and here they are. Father, I, I just thank you for this. I pray that you'll hasten the day that when Jesus shall come and we shall all be gathered together where there will be no more day nor night and no more time that will blend into eternity and where we can all be together forever. Grant it, Lord. If there be some here this morning, Lord, who doesn't know you as their Savior, may they want to get acquainted with this Lamb who holds a seven-sealed mystery book in his hand. God, may we be acquainted with him so in the future when we see those seals broke open, then we can see what God is speaking to us about. We ask it for God's glory through the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. And while we have our heads bowed, will there be someone say, Remember me, Brother Branham, as you pray. And I'd like to be remembered in prayer. God bless you, and God bless you, and God bless you, and you, you, yes, God be good to you. Yes. Maybe uh, two dozen hands or more. Of... Oh, Lord, you see their hands. You know their desire. You know what's in their heart. I don't. I pray that you will reveal to them, Lord, your goodness and your mercy. Give them pardon for whatever it is. If it's sickness, Lord, heal their bodies and make them well. Do, Father, while the anointing of the Holy Spirit is up on the meeting, uh, upon the congregation now, may the great God of heaven just so anoint that he'll bless everyone in divine presence. And we might go away from here this morning saying, did not our hearts uh, burn uh, uh, Grant it, Lord. Now I'm weak and tired. My voice is gone. And I, I just pray, God, for my own strength. Will you help me? Will you strengthen me? Pass that little wound down there, Lord. Will you please let the holy oil of God move in? Amen. And, and, and every other wound, Lord, every word, every body, we want to live, Lord, to be your hour and your glory. And, and heal all the sick and afflicted and, and get glory to thyself, Lord, because we realize it won't be long, but we'll, we won't have these meetings anymore. They'll be gone they'll be in the past. Now, Father, bless, uh, we ask all together, through Jesus Christ's name. And then, Father, we would also ask you to remember 
those who are going to be baptized this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus, that you'll give to them the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Grant it. Great glory and honor. Grant it. Grant it, Father. We commit it all to you now, and Father, with all that I'll throw myself in. Yes. Don't forget me, Lord. Help me now. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.